I'd like to thank Brother Evan for reading our scriptural text on this morning, which came from the book of Matthew. The chapter was 6, and the verses were 5 through 14. And it's from that passage of scripture that I would like to draw upon the blackboards of your minds and preach from the subject, putting the P back in prayer. Putting the P back in prayer. Need for you to just bear with me on this morning as we get to why the title is what it is. But in the meantime, if you are sitting here on this morning, there's no need to even talk about prayer if you don't have the right relationship with God. I read somewhere in John chapter 9 verse 31 where the Bible says that God hears not sinners, but they that be a worshiper of God and does his will, him God hears. If we're not doing God's will on this morning, then you pray in vain. If we're not worshiping God in spirit and in truth and living according to the dictates of his holy word, will and way, then we pray in vain. This is why at this moment we're giving you the opportunity to make things right with your God before it's eternally and everlasting too late. It's no need for us to wait until we sing the song, Victory in Jesus. Jesus may come before we get to the first verse. We need to get right with our Lord and Savior right now so that we can pray to God and be heard of God and, and are able to call him our Father as we see in the model prayer in Matthew chapter 6. We must understand on this morning that we cannot pray our way into heaven. I, I know the preacher down the street says to do that. I know that there are many churches in Tucson that tell you to do that. But there isn't a scripture for it. No one has ever been able to pray their way into glory. We have to understand that the gospel, it is through the gospel that we are to come to Christ. John 6, 45. It is through believing that gospel and believing that Jesus is who he says he is that we believe unto righteousness, Romans 10, 10. It is through repentance, giving up sin, that we repent unto life, according to Acts chapter 11, verse 18. It is through confessing Jesus Christ, the sweetest name on mortal tongue, that we confess unto salvation, Romans 10.10. 10. And by doing these things, acting in faith, we are baptized into Christ, according to Galatians chapter 3, verse 27. And it's only when we come about the water that we can pray to God, knowing that we have been born again knowing that we have received the spirit of adoption according to Galatians chapter 4 verse 6 and John chapter 3 verse 5, that we are able to pray to the creator of the universe and be heard by him. So in the same pattern as to our radio program, it doesn't matter what I have prepared on this morning. If you know at that moment that you need to come to Jesus, just come on down. We will stop like we do for the radio program, address your need, and then get back to the regularly scheduled programming. Because we need to get right with God before it's eternally and everlasting too late. If you need to come to Jesus, you need to come now. If you want that victory in Jesus, you need to come now. If you hear something in the message and you say, you know what? If God's not hearing my prayers and I read about this benefit in prayer, I need to have that benefit. Then come on down. This is what it's about. It's about saving souls on today. And so as we talk about putting the P back in prayer, we must first understand what prayer is. Well, prayer is the means by which humanity connects with the divine. The way that we connect with God is through prayer. God talks to us through his word, but we talk to God through prayer. Not only that, we see this in Luke chapter 2, verse 36 and 37. It's in this story that we read about a prophetess and a widow by the name of Anna. The Bible says that she worshiped God with 
her prayers. There's a reason why we come together and pray. We come together and pray according to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 15, because it is a part of our worship to God. If we're not talking to God while we're trying to worship God, then what is it that we're doing? We have to talk to God. Our prayers are to be directed to God. Don't you know that God is available to hear our pleas? He is available to hear our cries. He is available to hear our requests. He is available to hear our supplications. He is available to hear our intercessions. And he is available to hear our thanksgivings. But he is only available to hear these things on two occasions. That's day and night. I mean, do we have some deal fans in the house on this morning? God only hear our prayers on two occasions, day and night. That means that God is always listening. Again, prayer is how we talk to God. Just like we talk to one another, either publicly or privately. Prayer to God can also be done publicly or privately. We have an example of public prayer in 1 Kings chapter 8, verses 22 through 53. It is where King Solomon prayed to God in the presence of all the assembly of Israel. He wanted everybody to hear his conversation with God and how he prayed for them in the presence of God. But not only that, there are moments in which we need some alone time with the Father. Not every prayer is to be offered publicly. Because there are some moments in which we need to get in our closet. There are some moments in which we need to enter our war room. There are some moments in which we need to retreat to a mountain. There are going to be some times in which we need to be alone with the Father, and we do this by following the example of Jesus Christ that we read about in Mark chapter 1, verse 35, as well as Luke chapter 5 in the verses 16. Now, the name of this sermon is putting the P back in prayer. Now, if you take the P out of prayer, what do you have? You have something that's rare. If you take the P out of prayer, then what you have is that which is rare. Now, the definition of the word rare is infrequent, unusual, and uncommon. That's the definition of rare. So when we take the P out of prayer, we have taken a means of communication which is to be done frequently, earnestly, and always, and transformed it into something that is infrequent, unusual, and uncommon. And this is contrary to the word of Almighty God. We read in Luke chapter 18 and the verses 1 that we are to pray always and not lose heart. In Romans chapter 12 and the verse is 12, we are told that we are to be constant in prayer. In Ephesians chapter 6 and the verse is 18, we are told that we are to pray at all times. In Colossians chapter 4 and the verse is 2, we are to continue steadfastly in prayer. And when we look at the words of the Apostle Paul in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 through 18, we are told to pray always without ceasing and in all circumstances. Prayer must be a fundamental part of our lives. We must pray habitually. We must pray frequently. And we must Pray consistently. Prayer ought not to be something that is rare in the life of the Christian. But I want to go a little further because the word rare has a second definition. The second definition of the word rare is uncooked. Uncooked. We use this term in regards to meat. Therefore, we understand that rare is the opposite of another phrase, and that phrase is well done. Prayer is never supposed to be rare. 
Prayer must be well done. Is somebody with me on this morning? All right, let's, 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 let's stick with it. All right. Prayer must be well done. So when we take the P out of prayer, then our prayers are not well done. In the book of Acts alone, there are 28 different times the word pray and all of its verb forms is found. It is in the book of Acts that we see the power of God displayed through prayer that is well done and not rare. In Acts chapter 1 and the verses 14, don't you know that coming together, first coming together and devoting ourselves to prayer is prayer well done. In Acts chapter 1, and the verses 24, praying to God first before any and every decision is prayer well done. In Acts chapter 3 and the verses 1, purposely making time to talk to God is prayer well done. In Acts chapter 4 and the verses 31, praying for boldness to speak God's word is prayer well done. In Acts chapter 6, and the verse is six, thanking God for solving a problem is prayer well done. In Acts chapter eight and the verse is 15, praying to God with a disposition of total dependency is prayer well done. In Acts chapter eight and the verse is 22, praying for forgiveness is prayer well done. In Acts chapter eight, and the verses 24, praying for mercy is prayer well done. In Acts chapter 12 and the verses 5, praying for others in their time of need is prayer well done. In Acts chapter 14 and the verses 23, praying for our elders is prayer well done. In Acts chapter 16, and the verses 25, praying to God in the midst of our darkest moments is prayer well done. In Acts chapter 21, and the verses are 5 and 6, praying for safe travel is prayer well done. In Acts chapter 27, and the verses 29, praying for God for deliverance from danger is prayer well done. And in Acts chapter 28, and the verse is eight, praying for the sick to recover, is prayer well done. So we need to put the P back in prayer so that our prayers are not rare, but that they are frequent, consistent, and well done. So the question goes, how? How do we put the P back in prayer? Well, Jesus teaches us how to do that. When he gave the model prayer in Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 13. See, oftentimes in the religious world, when we look at Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 13, we call that the Lord's Prayer. But that's not the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer is found in John chapter 17, that last prayer that he prayed for his apostles prior to him dying on Calvary's cross. That's the Lord's prayer where he says, neither do I pray for these alone, but for every one of them that believe on me through their word, that they all may be one. Just like I am one with you and you are one with me, that they may be one in us. That's the Lord's prayer. John chapter 17, verse 20 and 21. What we have in Matthew chapter 6, verse 9 through 13, is what is known as the model prayer, in which Jesus is teaching us how to pray, how to pray, where he says, Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And in some translations, it will even go on to say, For thine is the power, the kingdom, and glory forever and ever. Amen. And so what we see here is Jesus giving humanity 
an outline on how to talk to the Father. And so there's five points that I want to bring to your attention, five brief points that I want to bring to your attention, and the lesson would be yours to respond to. PowerPoint number one is this. When we look at that part of the prayer where Jesus says, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. We are to pray with perspective. See what I'm doing there? The P, perspective. <laughs> pray with perspective. This is how we put the P back in prayer. We need to pray with perspective. Now, by definition, perspective is the proper or accurate point of view or the ability to see it. It's objectivity. So as Christians, we are children of God. And our prayers must lay claim to our personal and close relationship to God. Knowing our God's location puts in perspective his holiness and our desire to be holy as he is holy. Now, when we see that phrase or that word hollow, hollow be your name. To hollow the name of God means simply to hold him in reverence, to place him in that special high and holy place where he belongs as the God of all creation and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So when we pray to God, we need to have the right and proper perspective of who he is. That we're trying to get to where he's at. That we look to him. We didn't create God. God created us. God is not created in our image. We are created in God's image. Sometimes we talk to God as if he's one of our boys. Yo, what's up? I got this problem. Can you help a brother out? Like he's some cosmic bellhop that's supposed to come every time we call him. As if we don't serve God, God serves us. We think that way. But when we pray with perspective, we recognize that without him, we're nothing. We recognize that we wouldn't even be where we're at if it wasn't for his goodness. The only reason why we got up this morning is because he woke us up. And we need to always keep that in mind when we pray to God with the right perspective. So when we pray, we must have the perspective of the psalmist that we read about in Psalm 115 and the verses 1. In Psalm 115 and the verses 1, the Bible reads, Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory for the sake of your steadfast love and your faithfulness. So not only must we pray with perspective, but PowerPoint number two is found in Jesus' phrase in the prayer where he says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So PowerPoint number two is this. Not only must we pray with perspective, but we must pray for priorities. We must pray for priorities. Now, by the term or the word priority, priorities are the things we put first. The items we give special attention to. So when we see him say, pray this prayer, your kingdom come. Well, this kingdom is the rule of heaven in the person of Jesus Christ, and it comes not to nations or lands, but to individuals who will receive the will of God in their hearts. See, the hope is that men will acknowledge and submit to Jesus' power and his will gladly. And so when we talk about putting Christ first, when we talk about putting God first and how we must do this cheerfully, 
then we understand on this morning that we gladly submit to God by giving him the first thought of every day. Psalm chapter 5 and the verses 3. So if we truly understand that text, then when the alarm clock goes off in the morning, instead of saying, good Lord, it's morning, <laughs> we wake up and say, good morning, Lord. We cheerfully bow to the rule of God by giving him the first day of every week. I want to say that again. We cheerfully bow to the rule of God by giving him the first day of every week, according to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. We joyfully surrender to the authority of God by giving him the first fruits of our increase according to Proverbs chapter 3 and the verses 9 and we zealously defer to the will of God by giving him the first consideration in every decision according to Proverbs chapter 3 verse 5 and 6 so when we pray we must establish our priorities according to the words of Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 6 6 verse 33 a very familiar passage of scripture where Jesus said but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you don't you know that he starts off he concludes with that statement but he starts off by talking about how we have nothing to worry about he says birds eat every day don't have a job aren't you more valuable than the birds? He says, the grass are decked out every morning. So many flowers to adorn them. He said, they are here today, gone tomorrow. Aren't you more valuable to God than grass? He says, so if God can feed the birds and if he can dress the grass, then he can feed and dress you. So we have to understand that our part is to seek first the kingdom of God. All these other things that we tend to worry about, that's God's part. He'll take care of that. But we have to do our part. And so pray with perspective. Pray for priorities. And PowerPoint number three is in the phrase, give us this day our daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. So PowerPoint number three is this. We need to pray for provisions. We have to pray for provisions. Now provision is the meeting of needs. And so when Jesus uses the phrase bread in this text, what that word bread represents is all of life's bodily needs. In other words, when we pray for provision, we're praying for food, we're praying for clothing, we're praying for shelter, we're praying for life, we're praying for health, we're praying for strength. Praying for provisions recognize God for who he is, Jehovah Jireh. That means that our God will provide according to Genesis 22 verse 14. Praying for provisions makes clear our total dependency on God for all of our needs. That means that we recognize that the house we live in, the car we drive, the shoes on our feet, the clothes on our backs, is not because we're so good at what we do. It's because of how good God is at who he is. It is because we cannot have any of these things if it had not been for the Lord by our side. So praying for daily provisions teaches us that we can have our needs met today, but they can also be gone tomorrow. Ecclesiastes chapter 9 verse 11. Therefore, we must thank God and ask God to do it again. And that's, in essence, what we're praying for. We're saying, Lord, thank you for keeping a roof over my head last night. Can you do it again today? Thank you for allowing me to walk outside and I not be naked. Can you help me out again today? And while you're at it, can you do it again tomorrow? Because we recognize that if we don't thank God for what he has done for us today, then what guarantee do we have that he'll do it again for us on tomorrow? As a matter of fact, what if God only gave us tomorrow what it is that we thanked him for today? 
Will we have tomorrow the things that we have today? When you get a moment, take a look at Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 1 through 10. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 1 through 10, it is in that text that we see that, we see that it is through provisions that we remember God. Whenever God provides for us, then we remember that it was God who provided for us. And we are humbled by God. What did the children of Israel do to grow manna? What did they do to grow manna? Nothing. They complained about not having meat. Which Israelites shot down quail? None of them. But God provided the manna. God provided the meat. God gave them a land. They were able to drink from vineyards that they didn't even plant. Able to have oil and olive trees that they didn't even plant. Going into cities that are already established. God gave it all to them. Provided for them. And it was designed to humble them. It is through provision that we recognize that we lack nothing from God. So my brothers and sisters, when we pray, we must seek provisions, not by our own strength or even by the will of man, but from God above. It is through provision we must have the attitude of the Apostle Paul. In 1 Timothy chapter 6 and the verses 8, where the Apostle Paul writes, But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. Pray with perspective. Pray for priorities. Pray for provisions. And PowerPoint number four is found in his phrase, and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. What he's telling us here is that we need to pray for pardon. We need to pray for pardon. Now, when we look at that word pardon, the word pardon is the renouncing of resentment and the reestablishing of a relationship that has been damaged by an offense. So that means that when we ask God to forgive us, we're saying, Lord, can you cease being angry with me long enough to hear my plea, forgive my sin, and reconcile myself back to you? So this is what we pray for. We pray for pardon. Becoming a Christian does not end our battle with sin, nor does it end our need for grace. See, as Christians, there must be a continuing and increasing sensitivity to sin and all things shameful and dishonorable. Oftentimes, as Christians, we forget that we used to be sinners. Sometimes we think we have come into the church just fine, as apple pie and everything's going to be all right and, and, and that we've done no wrong. And so when we see a brother and a sister that has stumbled along the way, we don't get down and help them back up, but rather we look down upon them and say, shame on you. How could you do such a thing? Failing to realize that we too used to be that person that tripped on that rock and fell on our face and needed somebody to stoop down and pick us back up, just as what Jesus has done for each and every one of us. And so just because we have become Christians don't mean that we no longer need grace. We need grace more than ever now than we've ever needed it before. So as, our bro so as brothers and sisters in Christ, we ought to be glad to know that God's grace and God's mercy is not a one-time gift. God doesn't say, I was gracious once. Now you're out of luck. I displayed mercy for you back in 86. I can't help you no more. We don't serve a God of a second chance. We serve a God of another chance. Amen. Because I don't know about you, I've used my second chance up a long, long, long time ago. But God is so good to us that he is still a God of grace and he is still a God of mercy. Let me hasten on to my conclusion because time is running out. Praying for pardon, don't you know that it is actually done in vain if we fail to forgive others. Oftentimes we want God to forgive us, but we haven't forgiven others. 
We say, God, forgive us of our sins. But he has made our pardon conditioned on our ability to forgive others. Hear what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 14 and 15. He says, for if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your heavenly Father forgive your trespasses. So my brothers and sisters, when we pray, we must meet, we must we must remember what was done for us in Colossians chapter 3, verse 13. This way we can pray with integrity and do the same for others. The Apostle Paul writes, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. And so we must pray with perspective, pray for priorities, pray for provisions, pray for pardon. And PowerPoint number five is found in Jesus' phrase, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. This is us praying for protection. We must pray for protection. Now, protection is preservation from injury or harm. The purpose of this is for us to desire a new life by conquering the weaknesses which previously brought us down. So as Christians, we will be tempted. But this is a request to be saved from temptation's power. And so this prayer for protection does not stop Satan from tempting. But it is a petition to God for us not to be overwhelmed by temptation or caused to fall because of temptation. This is why the Apostle Paul tells us what he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, that we will never be tempted above that which we are able because God is able to provide an escape for us to come out of it. So when we pray, our prayer for protection is to make us vigilant and keep us faithful until that glorious day when God fulfills his promise in Romans chapter 16. Verse 19 and 20. In Romans chapter 16, verse 19 and 20, Paul's benediction was, For your obedience is known to all, so that I rejoice over you, but I want you to be wise as to what is good and innocent, as to what is evil. The God of peace will, crooks, will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. At this time, let us go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity that you have given us this day to make things right with you before it's eternally and everlasting too late. Father God, we thank you for this avenue of prayer. Father God, we recognize that you are a God that sits high and looks low, that you're the uncreated creator, that you created everybody and everything. Without us, you will always be you, but without you, there will be no us. You're so precious holy and blessed. We thank you for being a benevolent God, a God who hears our prayers and allows our cries to come before you. Thank you for being gracious and merciful, forgiving and loving. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for being righteous and holy altogether. We come to you, Father God, asking you to rule in our hearts, to rest in our hearts, that your will is our will, that we will follow you, that we will surrender all to you because you are the God of heaven that does all things well. Father, we have nowhere else to go but to go to you. Help us to always recognize that and remember that, that the only reason why we're walking and talking, living and breathing is because you have been so good to us. Heavenly Father, thank you for all the things that you have blessed us with. Father God, we know that everything that we have and our needs being met is not because of our intelligence, it's not because of our might, it's not because of our wealth, but it is because of you. So help us to always be humbled by the fact that anything that we have today can easily be taken tomorrow. Therefore, we thank you today and we show our gratitude towards you for all that you have given us because we appreciate everything that we have. Teach us, Heavenly Father, to count our blessings. Forgive us of our sins. 
Lord, we want to always be able to talk to you and be heard by you. So help us to always live the life necessary that when we come before you in prayer, that you will hear our prayers, that you will continue to just forgive us of our sins, keep us away from sin. So we ask for your protection. We know, Heavenly Father, that the more we draw closer to you, the harder Satan works. And so, Heavenly Father, we just ask that you help us to keep our eyes on you, that we will always keep our hand in your hand, that we will always be within your hedge of protection, that we will not go from mountain to hill, that we will not leave the fold, but we will stay where you are, and where your good shepherd is, Jesus Christ. Help us always remain committed to you. Now, Father God, as we conclude this prayer, as we conclude our conversation with you on this morning, we ask, Heavenly Father, that if there's a heart in the assembly that needs to be touched, if there's a Christian in this audience that's not praying as they ought, that have not really committed to you in prayer as we're supposed to, we ask, Heavenly Father, that they will come make things right with you on this morning. If there's somebody, Father God, that just simply needs the saints to pray for them because they're going through some things, they struggle with having the right perspective, they struggle with having the right priorities, they struggle with giving you the glory and the gratitude for their provisions, they struggle with sin in their lives. They struggle to recognize you as the one who is their protector. We pray, Father God, that they will make things right with you on this morning. But Heavenly Father, if there's anyone in our assembly this day that is yet to name the name of Christ, if there's someone in here that we cannot call brother or sister right now, don't allow them to leave this place until such a time that they put you on in baptism, put your son on in baptism, that they have their sins washed away, that you become more than just their creator, but you become their heavenly father. Father God, we just ask that you touch a heart to come to repentance and to be saved on today. Wherever we are in this room, wherever we are in this building, even if there's anybody listening to us and watching us on video on today, Father God, that they need to just get in their car and drive to 1513 West Roller Coaster Road. Make it happen, Father God, so that heaven can be more than just our home, but heaven can also be their home. Father God, let us sing this song that we're about to sing, Victory in Jesus. Let us all be able to sing that song with integrity, knowing that when Jesus comes again, we shall be victorious because in Christ we win. So I pray that before this song ends, we're all in Christ. This is our prayer. In Christ's name we pray. Let us all say amen. amen. If you stand subject to the invitation, we ask that you come now while together we stand and sing the song that has been selected. <laughs>